for coming. Uh, we got a competitive uh, marketplace for competing events and so I think it's pretty good that we've got such a pretty full room and I know we're going to fill up the rest uh, really shortly. We're here uh, launching the Development Finance Institution's Comes of Age, a report uh, both by CSIS and the Overseas Development Institute. Um, it was, we really appreciate our partners at EDFI and OPIC for helping support and make this happen. Thank you very, very much. Um, I think we've got a really interesting uh, program today to talk about um, the changing role of DFIs in the global development landscape. I think you'll you'll get a sense of what we're we're trying to do. We've got uh, a number of um, things we want to share with you today. I'm going to go through a brief PowerPoint, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to David Kennedy, who's a senior official at DFID, the bilateral aid agency. Uh, for the United Kingdom. I just want to say that uh, here in the United States we spend a lot of time uh, paying attention to what DFID does and what CDC does and so we're really pleased that David's here and Diana Noble's here because I consider both CDC and DFID to be some of the finest development institutions in the world and we really do take our cues from you so thank you for both for being here. Um, let me go through a couple of slides uh, that we've got up, up here that I want to talk about. Um, so development institutions come of age, policy engagement impact in new directions, some of the findings from our report that I want to just quickly go through or what we've been doing. Let's see if this works. How's this, how's the uh, team technology? How are we doing? Are, is this, if I, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, this was a partnership between CSIS
aren't necessarily going to do unplanned migrations because they don't have any opportunities in their home country, if you care about uh, emp economic empowerment for women, if you care about water and getting people water, you care about agriculture and juicing up agriculture so that we can feed 9 billion people, well, guess what? That's, these are all functions of the private sector, some kind of private sector, and it's not necessarily going to be ODA that's going to do that. The way in which the vectors by which agencies or outside actors are going to have an impact are going to be through DFIs. It's going to be through OPEC or IFC. Uh, let me just come back to, let me just, this issue of, um, of sort of th these being sort of obscure organizations. I had lunch five years ago with Bob Zellick's chief lobbyist in the building between the MC, which is the most important building at uh, the World Bank, the main, whatever it is, the main MC, that's the big one. And then uh, F is the IFC building, because F is the, 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 the shorthand for all the cool kids who know what IFC is F. I don't know why they come, it's called F, but okay. But so it's F. And so I'm sitting there at the IMF restaurant called Founding Farmers. Many of you have been there. And I'm at the restaurant and I'm talking, I'm t sorry, I know some of you heard this story, I apologize, but so, that we talked about IFC this and IFC that and IFC this and IFC that and the waiter, so this is between the main building of the World Bank and the IFC, stopped us at the end and said, I have to interrupt, I have to ask, do you work for the independent film channel? <laughs> and so I just think, so this is not, you know, this is, not, uh, this is not a problem just for the Danes, it's not a problem for the Americans, it's not a problem for Diana Noble who works for CDC and they're asked about how are things at Zika and Ebola or how are things in Atlanta, that you're the other CDC, that, that this is a, this is, these institutions are much more serious and have a much bigger stake and we actually, if we want to make a difference in development, then we have to understand the capabilities and limits of DFIs. We also, the DFIs actually have to engage in the policy conversation in a much bigger way than they have in the past. Policymakers have to understand the difference between equity meaning equality and equity meaning share, like making an investment in a company, right? Because a lot of the development community talks about equity and they're not talking about making an equity investment. They're talking about things like we need equity on something, you know, equality of some kind or you no know, difference between equity and debt or what a, what a, a portfolio loan guarantee is. I, most national security advisors have no idea what you're talking about. Most undersecretaries for economic affairs probably don't know what you're talking about. Most AID staffers don't probably know what you're talking about. But at the same time, they're the ones at the table talking about this stuff. Um, and so both the aid world and the DFI's world need to work together. They need to have a better understanding of, of uh, division of labor. So that's, that's why we did this is because of this context. That's why we did this, this study. So what did we do? We had a whole series of meetings. We had a process. We brought in European perspectives, American perspectives, NGO perspectives, uh, D ODA aid perspectives. Um, so we had a series of roundtables. Um, what were our big takeaways? What were our bumper sticker findings? Given the broad acceptance of the private sector centrality in driving the global development, I talked about Addis Ababa. If you look at the SDGs, go read the SDGs. Go read the high-level panel report. You'll see all of this. DFIs are going to continue to grow. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Both policymakers, I'm talking about foreign ministries, I'm talking about heads of aid agencies, I'm talking about national security advisors, I'm talking about finance ministry leadership, I'm talking about executive directors at the World Bank or multilateral development institutions, policymakers, and DFI shareholders, so the folks who get the annual reports, show up on, sit on the boards and get kind of the, the updates on this stuff, need to better understand the unique role of DFIs in the wider aid architecture but DFIs themselves should engage in shaping this conversation in an active and constructive way while protecting successful elements of their business model and core competencies. I think this is very, very important. DFIs are going to be asked to go to tougher, dumpier places. It's much, they're not going to be doing telecom deals in Brazil anymore. I'm not going to name places. I don't want to offend anybody. But just, some, just think of the most fragile, most difficult places you can think of. It's going to be smaller deals. You're going to make less money. 
uh, if you're an investment officer, you've been graded in the past on the amount of money you can push out the door. It's called a volume culture at DFIs. And when I was at IFC, doing any of this policy stuff was baloney. This was BS. You know, doing technical assistance stuff wasn't as sexy as being an investment officer and doing real deals and being a real investment officer. Because when you're at a DFI, when you grow up, you want to go run an African private equity fund. When you're at AID, when you grow up, you want to go run an NGO, you want to go be ambassador to the Central African Republic, you want to become a mission director, maybe you want to become an assistant secretary of state. So it's a different career track and it's a different mindset. And so I think historically, these institutions haven't talked to each other and have had different incentives. So, but at the same time, I think this issue of, the, as you guys, as DFIs are being asked to go to these tougher places and do harder missions, it, to the extent that they lose money or that you break the business model, you're going to have problems. IFC last night announced that it made its first loss, in, I think maybe in history or maybe the second time in its history. I, I think these are the sort of things where we're going to be asked to do harder things. At the same time, we can't bank DFIs. We can't ask them to go, do so much that we break the IFC's, uh, the DFI business model because it has been successful. Okay. So here's the, the numbers. Uh, you see the, uh, the DFI line is creeping up. I don't think it does a very good justice to sort of how, how close it's going to be. I, don't, I think this is actually get much, this is going to get much closer. This is us being a little aggressive in terms of where we think it's going to go. But I'm telling you, sometime in the next 10 years, the lines are going to cross. That's the main point here. The lines are going to cross. Big development, ODA, is going to be on par with or smaller than tradition, than DFI's investments. And when that happens, DFI's are going to be thought of in a different way. There's going to be a higher level of scrutiny, there's going to be a high level of responsibility, and there's going to be all sorts of asks on them. And they're being asked to do this now. You're being asked to go to fragile states. You're being asked, to, what are you doing about the immigration, the global refugee crisis? What are you doing about helping us stand up, stop things in Afghanistan? What are you doing about things in the Northern Triangle? How are you helping us get peace in our time in Colombia? What are you doing about helping feed 9 billion people? What are you doing about power? What are you doing about water? These are all on the DFI agenda, and this is only going to increase at the same time. Um, so I think it's going to require DFIs to play in a different way. OK, so those are my points. That's, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to turn the floor over um, to David Kennedy, who's a, a senior aid official from DFID. So he's not with the DFI, but I think you'll understand why in a second, why we wanted David Kennedy to come speak as a representative from, from big development, from ODA, as opposed to, to open this conversation up. And then we're going to have a panel discussion with our friends, uh, some several friends of mine. So come on up, David. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dan, and good morning, everybody. So, as Dan says, I am uh, responsible for e e Let me speak properly. I've got a bit of jet lag there. I am responsible for economic development at DFID, and as part of that, I'm responsible for our development finance institution, so CDC. We've got the chief executive, Diana Noble, who you're going to hear from on the panel uh, after my words. I'm also responsible for our interest in the international financial institutions, and in particular for this discussion, our interest in the IFC. Now, what I want to do is just say a few words about our approach to economic development at DFID. Within that, uh, how the uh, CDC, our DFI, and the role of that in the broader approach. And then I just want to come on to the report, which I want to strongly welcome. Uh, and I want to comment on a few of the recommendations in the report. So if I start with uh, economic development, so that's a priority at DFID. It became a priority under uh, our previous Secretary of State around two or three years ago. And in saying it's a priority, what she did was she established my role, a new Director General of Economic Development. She made a spending commitment. We would spend £1.8 billion every year uh, on economic development through our bilateral programs, so in addition to anything we do through the uh, IFIs. And since then, we've been working through, well, what is our approach to economic development? How are we going to make sure that we get really good uh, value uh, for that uh, money? So economic development, I should say, remains a priority for anybody who's been watching the UK. You will have seen that we had a referendum. We've decided to leave the EU, uh, so that's the Brexit 
We do have a new Secretary of State, and our new Secretary of State, who's here for the annual meet for the annual meetings, is absolutely committed to economic development. So, still is a priority for us. She will be talking while she's here about the importance of trade, investment, and jobs, and that's the heart of the DFID approach to our broader uh, set of. Uh, things that we do in development. So economic development is still a priority. We started off by saying, well, what do we mean by economic development? Uh, and I think we've evolved from, you could say, a livelihoods approach. So, uh, for example, with a focus on microfinance uh, and microcredit to something that's much more about structural transformation of economies. So we're about poverty reduction. If you're about poverty reduction, you need productivity improvement in poor countries. And you only get that through structural transformation. So we want to create opportunities for people who are doing unproductive things, so subsistence agriculture, microenterprise, uh, to do much more uh, productive things. And if you ask, well, what does that mean in practice? It's a move away from subsistence agriculture to commercial agriculture, uh, to developing that rural but off-farm economy. It's about cities and developing cities. It's about jobs in cities. Industrialization, we think, is a big part of that. Uh, investment in energy and other infrastructure, again, is a big part of that. So it's our focus is on commercial agriculture, industry, infrastructure, urbanization, cities, uh, and putting those together to get an inclusive growth story. So that's our, our focus. Uh, Dan's already said, well, is this all about uh, ODA? Of course it's not. So ODA has a really important role to play, but that's in unlocking the private finance. So uh, ODA cannot match the scale of the challenge. Private finance can. We need those private flows, but also we need the private expertise as well to, to drive uh, that economic development, that inclusive uh, jobs, intense growth process. So this is all about unlocking private uh, money. We think we can do three things, actually, as DFID. So we can work on the conditions for investment. We can improve the investment climate. And that's about technical assistance. It's about policy dialogue in those key areas, making sure that the laws, the regulations, the institutions are in place which will uh, uh, support uh, bankable investments in those key areas. Second thing we think is, well, you can't just sit back, and this is where CDC comes in. You can't just sit back and say, well, we've improved the investment climate. Let's uh, wait for the floodgates to open and, and for the commercial finance to come in, because we think if you did that, you would be waiting for a very uh, long time. So we think we need that catalytic investment. That's what the uh, development finance institutions do. They can show uh, that the investment climate is actually improved in a practical sense. Uh, we can get in place bankable and viable investments, and those can demonstrate following which we hope the commercial finance will uh, will flow in. So that catalytic investment role uh, is really important. And then there's something about working in partnerships that we don't think uh, it's all about DFID and CDC. We don't think it's all about the World Bank, uh, IDA, IBRD, IFC, whatever. It's about all of us, the DFIs, the donors, the MDBs working together. Because if we can do that, and I think there are challenges in doing that, so we're not there yet, but we can be bigger than the sum of the parts. So three things we can do, investment, climate improvement, catalytic investment, and working together in partnership. And if we can do that, we think we can move forward this economic development process. Now, moving on to CDC. So this is our development finance institution. Uh, this is something which is of central importance to DFID. I think it's fair to say that before Diana came along, before I came along, uh, it, it went off and it did its own thing a few years ago. It was investing in funds in China. It was making nice returns. There was a question over what was the development impact that we were getting from the CDC. But under Diana's leadership, uh, it has gone on a, a very significant journey. So it's gone from being a funder of funds. It does direct investments. Uh, it's very focused now on poor countries, difficult countries. Uh, it's very focused on jobs uh, and those sectors where we think there is the opportunity to uh, create jobs. It's gone from being purely an equity institution to uh, also doing some debt as well. So a very big journey for uh, the CDC uh, over the last few years, as I say, under Diana's leadership. It's not the only investment vehicle that we have. So we have, uh, for example, the Private Infrastructure Development Group. That's a multilateral vehicle with the biggest investor in it, uh, invests in uh, project development in agriculture, in energy, in infrastructure, and then it can finance through a range of instruments, uh, investments that ensue there. 
Uh, we've got Agdevco, another investment vehicle that is doing early stage, opening up the space for commercial investments in agriculture. So uh, this investment space, CDC, is absolutely central. We do have other vehicles as well. Uh, the IFC is a big part of, we think, uh, the solution in economic development. And again, uh, you can question how developmental has IFC been in the very difficult countries in particular. That's something we've been pushing uh, over the last uh, several years. We want uh, IFC to do more in the fragile states, in the IDA countries. We want them to do more transformational stuff uh, as well. And I think that's the key word I want to leave you with, transformational investment. It's not the case that you can just invest and assume that's going to be uh, good for economic development. You've got to direct that investment to those sectors with growth potential and try to unlock uh, big investment plays in those sectors. So uh, very focused on the, the IFC. And I think Dan mentioned uh, possibly it was in the, the breakfast meeting, not this one, that there is the private sector window we've pushed very hard uh, for the IFC. So $2.5 billion uh, from the uh, next round of IDA funding. So IDA 18, $2 billion will be available to uh, the IFC. Half a billion will be available to MEGA to allow them to get into these more difficult countries and do more transformational things. So that's a great uh, sign of success, assuming that's agreed uh, as we uh, conclude the IDA process through this year. So that's enough, I think. Uh, about what we do at DFID, about the role of development finance institutions, uh, CDC, through to, to IFC. Uh, I just wanted to come back on some of the recommendations in the report, and in particular I want to talk about uh, DFIs working with policymakers. I want to talk about the risk appetite of DFIs. I want to talk about resourcing, and then I want to talk about communication. And I want to finish just by encouraging all of the DFIs to, to work together to collaborate. Uh, but if I start with uh, the first of those, so uh, the recommendation on working with policymakers, uh, again, I think Dan's been very clear that you know, DFIs uh, have transaction people who work there. So we shouldn't be expecting the DFIs to take the lead on policymaking. But I think there's a really important role for DFIs in the policy space. And the way that we're working with CDC uh, is twofold, or is at least twofold. So. Uh, first of all, I've talked about transformation. We are changing and evolving the CDC strategy to make it focus on those transformational sectors, so sharpening incentives to work in energy, for example, to work in manufacturing and commercial agriculture. And that is a, a discussion that is very much a partnership discussion. So I think there's a really important role with uh, DFIs uh, working through the strategy and getting that focused with the policymakers on the right countries and on the right sectors. And as I say, that's very much a partnership for us. I think the second thing is, I've said we're doing investment climate work. And I think the, the risk and what I worry about is that as we do investment climate work, we're not investors at DFID. And we could be doing stuff that's a bit too textbook and that when uh, you take it to the investors, they say, well, actually, you know, that wasn't really uh, what bothered us. So what we're trying to do is work through a way uh, with CDC that we can test our investment climate, that we can do it in conjunction. We will drive this, but we need it to be tested uh, by CDC and other investment vehicles for us. So uh, those are two aspects where we think uh, you can go beyond the transaction, you can look at the bigger picture, and you can get involved in those discussions, you know, whilst recognizing the focus will always be transactions for uh, DFIs. I think the second thing, then, is, is risk appetite. So can we uh, have more risk appetite for the DFIs? Now, CDC already has a significant risk appetite. It has to get a, a minimum return of 3.5%, which obviously, for the countries that C CDC works in, is not a commercial return. So that's a sign of risk appetite. But going beyond that, uh, we also have an impact facility with CDC that doesn't have that same return expectation that allows bigger risks to be taken uh, where we think we can have a really good uh, development impact. So uh, we are in that space of saying, yes, we do have more risk appetite for that developmental stuff. It raises a question, how do you know that that trade-off you're making, you're getting a lower return, you're taking more risk, you're getting that development impact. 
uh, and that's something we're grappling with at the moment. We do want to get more in that space with CDC, so part of the strategy refresh is, you know, how can we build on that impact facility and take that, that greater risk. Now, we always come back to, if what you're trying to do is demonstrate you've got commercially viable opportunities, you've got to remember that if it's going to be commercially viable, uh, in the eyes of investors, you can't depart too far. So you've got to have a story to tell about, well, here's our return. It's not a commercial return, but it's on the path to that commercial return uh, so that we can crowd in uh, further investment through demonstration and then replication. But I think that is, is possible to do. Uh, we do have these other vehicles, AgDevCo, I've said, Pidge. Uh, again, these have risk appetite that doesn't require a commercial return. So we are very much in that space, and we think that the DFI should be uh, in that space as well. The, the IFC, by the way, which has a, a pretty high return relative to uh, CDC, which has prevented it from doing transformational stuff in uh, the poorer and the more fragile countries. Again, the private sector window is, is directly to address that, and we hope should allow a very significant change in what the IFC does there. So in terms of risk appetite, we recognize that the risk appetite was not appropriate for IFC in those contexts, and we've tried to do something about it with the private sector window. So strongly endorse that recommendation. I think the third recommendation was on resourcing. So do you need more resourcing and different kinds of resourcing for DFIs? And I think the answer is yes. So certainly as DFID, as we have focused on more difficult countries, that becomes more resource intensive. It's more difficult, needs more staff time uh, to do stuff in those difficult contexts. We're just talking with IDA uh, replenishment, actually, and again, uh, more of IDA will go to fragile states. That needs more resource from the banks. So some of the discussions I've had here uh, are about, well, upping the resource as you go into more difficult countries. And I think that applies to DFIs as well. So as you go into more difficult countries, as you do more difficult things, then you need more resource. I think there's a question I was discussing with Diana, well, how can DFIs get more into origination of deals? And as you go into more difficult countries where the deals are not there for you to just come in and finance, I think there's a natural question, do you want to get into that origination space? I think the answer is yes, it's difficult, and it's also resource intensive. So uh, I think that there is an argument for increasing resource in that sense. And then I think the third thing, as you're getting into more difficult countries, as you're taking more risk, uh, as you're increasing that risk appetite, then you've got to be thinking about that trade-off between returns uh, and development impacts. So that says you, you probably need people thinking not just about uh, the commercial aspects of transactions, but that trade-off between the return and the development impact. So uh, we will be uh, uh, talking with Diana about building up the development impact capacity of CDC as well. So resourcing more resource for a number of reasons and possibly different resource as well as the nature of uh, the DFI's changes. The last thing I wanted to comment on was the, the recommendation about communication. So well, it's always important, whatever you're doing, to tell a story. Uh, one of the things, actually, which I'm not sure if it's in the report, but there's telling a story uh, about the, the, the commercial viability so that you get the demonstration effect. And yeah, we, we think that demonstration effects ensue. You can kind of tell a story about it, but I think we've got to be much better because you know, if all you do is the deals that the DFIs do and nothing happens beyond those deals, you have a really good impact, but it's limited. So I, I think we need to, to work out more and to communicate and to really trigger those demonstration effects to bring in the capital beyond the specific projects that we are, we are financing. So that's part of telling a story. But there is telling a story. Whenever we go with economic development stuff to my Secretary of State, for example, she says, well, look, how many jobs are we going to get for this amount of money that we're putting in? And we've got to do better there. So one of the things I'm talking about while I'm here in DC, I've been with the jobs practice in the, the bank who are leading the, the Let's Work program that the DFIs are signed up to. And I think we have made good progress in being able to tell a story about jobs that ensue from investments, but we're not there yet. And so that is a really uh, important thing that we've got to do more work on and tell that story. And then I think the third thing is we've got to learn as well. So uh, that loop of, okay, we've made these investments, some things work better than others. How can we learn from that? How can we disseminate that knowledge across the DFIs? And then how can we update and evolve our strategies and approaches to reflect that learning? Again, I think some of that goes on, but I think there is more to do. So uh, recommendations of the report, I've picked four there. Uh, I am welcoming the report generally. I'm saying the recommendations are very well taken. And actually, I think we, uh, working with CDC, with IFC, are making progress there. But again, there is a lot more to do, so it's right that you flag these up. Uh, I'm going to finish now just by saying uh, 
the partnership, the collaboration. So the DFIs you've seen uh, do meet. They met in London, they met in Oxford over the summer. Uh, they will continue to meet. I think uh, when you put them together, there's a real uh, critical mass that we've got as DFIs. And if we can do that, we can be bigger than the sum of the parts. If we're bitty, just picking up deals here and there and not putting them together and not telling that story and you know, not getting the flagship interventions, then we will have some impact, but it's a lost opportunity. So that working together on the big priorities, the transformational opportunities in partnership uh, so that we can have something to point to and say we've made a real difference. Why don't you come in and invest in these things that will unlock that inclusive growth progress uh, process? Sorry, I think that's the price. So look, I'm going to finish there. Let me sum up and say economic development for DFID is an absolute priority. Uh, it still is under our new Secretary of State. Within that, we are working on investment climate, but DFI is doing that catalytic investment, uh, absolutely important. Our DFI, uh, we, uh, I should have said, actually have recapitalized already and are looking at putting more money in in the future. That is, is saying it's really important to us and we put our money where our mouth is. So CDC has been on a journey, it's central uh, to what we do, that catalytic investment, what you're doing in your DFIs is absolutely central as well. Uh, the report makes some very good recommendations, which I think we should all uh, act on, we should embrace, we should act on, and we should work together uh, to make sure, as I say, that we are more than the sum of the parts as the DFIs, in which case we can have a profoundly positive impact in this important area. So thank you uh, very much. Now you can see why much of the most important advanced leadership on the DFI conversation is coming from Europe, whether it's the UK or whether it's other member, EDFI member uh, countries are doing some of the most sophisticated thinking and doing. Uh, when I think about one of the other great DFIs, I think about FMO, the, the uh, Dutch, F, um, Dutch DFI, my friend Michael Barth, who's had an affiliation with us, was a former head of FMO, and, and, uh, and I think so people they have very high regard for FMO as well and many others that are here. So I'm going to ask the panelists to come on up, um, and uh, I'm going to ask, ask for technical help in bring, putting down this. Thanks, thanks, thanks my friends. Thanks. I was really happy this was almost an all female panel. It was great for my personal brand. I took all the pictures here and I took that out. Very sorry. I'm very sorry. This was great. Okay, my mic's off. Okay. So, okay. So, um, good. All right, so let's get started. Um, we've got a really distinguished set of panelists here uh, to help us. We have my friend Diana Noble, who runs CDC, the other CDC. This is Commonwealth Development Corporation, which is the, the British DFI, the UK's DFI, we've heard about. My friend Anna from Swed Fund, thank you for being here, the CEO of Swed Fund. Elizabeth Littlefield, my friend and co colleague, uh, the CEO and president of OPIC, the US DFI. And we have Aluk Zonneveld, who is the, both the head of bio, the Belgian DFI, but also is um, the he current head of EDFI Association, the association of the 15 or so DFIs. And then Daniela Balou Ayers, who is the um, s senior advisor to the Secretary of State for Development Issues. Is that a way to describe, is that a good way to describe it? So some of the more of an ODA or a development perspective, but I think, I think it's really important for the conversation we've been having. So I want to first start with um, I want to start with what's changed. I want to start with what's changed for all of you. So can I? I'm, I'm going to start with Daniela and put you on the spot. Daniela, could you just, just talk a little bit about you were part of the negotiations for the Addis Ababa document that I told people if they had trouble sleeping at night they should go <laughs> read. You were part of that, and could you just talk a little bit about how there, the thinking went on about the role of development finance and the role of the private sector and the role of these institutions that are here on the, on the stage? Yeah, sure. sure. You know, 2015 was a pretty extraordinary year from a development and diplomatic negotiation perspective. We had the financing for development agreement in uh, 
in Addis Ababa. In July, sustainable development goals were agreed by heads of state in September in New York, and then we had the climate agreement at the end of the year in Paris. Paris. Um, so I think those were notable both in the consensus that they represented on, on that set of issues and on common goals, but also in a very significant recognition that private investment was going to be a critical part of addressing any of those challenges. And you do see a real shift um, relative to previous agreements in that regard. So if you uh, look back to the Millennium Development Goals, which also were groundbreaking in certain ways and set measurable goals for success, but in many ways you could characterize them as an assistance prioritization agenda. A useful one, one that set some very meaningful targets, uh, catalyzed and put focus on health in particular, for instance. Um, but when you look now at the Sustainable Development Goals and the Financing for Development Agreement, uh, they really are agreements that speak to what are a common set of outcomes we want to achieve by 2030, and then how do we mobilize all the types of capital that will get us there. Uh, and really, that's private sector capital, that's assistance, and that's domestic budgets of countries themselves. So we did see a real shift uh, in the thinking and the policy environment, even though that arguably, and from the data, you can see that shift was already happening. Private investment had grown dramatically. Institutions were starting to work differently. But I think that common understanding now really opens the doors for development finance institutions uh, to play an increasingly significant role in partnership with aid agencies and other institutions in helping both achieve those goals and um, evolve the approach that many governments are taking to address those challenges. And we've uh, you know, in the U.S. context have started uh, to see that already and have had OPIC, for instance, uh, at the table as we crafted our uh, policy positions for the Financing for Development Agreement, for instance, and now as we think about implementation of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Okay, so I don't want to put my friends from the DFIs on the spot, so how many of you went to Addis Ababa? Okay, two of you. Two of you did not, right? I think that's, that's the point I'm trying to make, is not to embarrass anybody, but if this is such a big deal, why weren't all these folks there, right? And how many of you here are part of your World Bank, uh, bank fund delegations, official delegations? Okay, I think I'm making the point I'm trying to make here, right? I mean, these organizations are gonna surpass ODA and they have a big part, we just heard that this is a big part of the development future, so tell me what's, what's, what's wrong with this picture, I don't get it. So that, I think I've made my point in what I said. Anna, please. No, just a comment to that, because I think it was great to be in Addis on the Finance for Development Conference, just to listen to all the panels, because nearly every panel was about innovative financing, new facilities, and I was so surprised because it was like, this is something totally new. It's so excited. And it was totally we, new to them. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and that's my point, because every each of the new innovative facilities, some of my uh, European DeFi colleagues already, already were running. You had the EFU uh, climate facility, FMUO are doing their SME facility, in North and I can go right. on forever. So it was very interesting to see that instead of really uh, wrapping up and uh, taking the best practice example and scale them up, it was something like, this is something totally new. We are going to reinvent the wheel. And that is something we need to take into account. OK, so uh, there's the whole language about billions to trillions. I want to just do a little survey here. Who's heard the term billions to trillions? Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Everybody? Okay, so I'm gonna do another survey. So their ODA is $130 billion. If you go to the DAC, which is sort of the FIFA of the, sorry, I know it's a little bit awkward. The Major League Baseball <laughs> Commission of the, uh, of the aid world, the scorekeepers, right? They say it's 130 billion. So who in this room thinks in the next seven to 10 years we're gonna double ODA? Any takers? Any takers? Okay, nobody's, no one's gonna bet that we're gonna double ODA. Okay, so billions to trillions, and we ain't doubling ODA, and ODA is 130 <laughs> billion bucks. So where are we gonna get that money from? It's not ODA, I mean, ODA's got a role, don't get me wrong, if, you, if you've got trouble sleeping at night, go read all my reports about all the important ways I think we should use ODA in the future. It has to be different, 
and I want to get to that with this panel, but if we want to have billions of trillions, it seems to me that the folks at this, around this, this panel are going to be the folks that are going to help unlock the billions to trillions conversation. So if they're not part of the official delegations, if they're not at Addis Ababa, something's wrong with this picture, people, right? I think that's the point I'm, I'm trying to make here. So let me, I want to turn to the panelists. I'd like you all to each talk about how, what given sort of this context, could we talk, each of you talk briefly about how you see the, what's an appropriate division of labor between aid agencies and DFIs? So I'm going to start with Elizabeth, and then I want each of you, though, to talk about how do you each see this issue of an appropriate division of labor between aid agencies, traditional ODA, big development, and DFIs? Elizabeth, please. Well, thanks very much, Dan, and I apologize for my voice. Um, uh, and thank you for the report, which I think is advancing the conversation in a very constructive way. Um, as far as the aid agencies are concerned, for me, I think we're, we're, we're blending our roles in a way that's not very helpful because doing aid right is extremely technical, sophisticated, hard stuff. Managing grant programs, managing TA programs is very serious stuff. We don't have those skill sets at OPIC for sure. Mm. Similarly, you know, doing project finance in very difficult places with complex structures is also technical, sophisticated stuff, and we do have those, those skill sets. So I think that there's, and I'm proud to say that most of the most difficult work we've done in the most difficult markets in the last few years, we've done with AID in partnership, whether it's in Haiti, whether it's in Egypt, Tunisia, the West Bank, in almost every case. Those all sound like places that are geostrategically important to the United States. Just, just, just saying. They do or mm -hmm. they don't? No, they do. Tunisia, I, West Bank, sound like places that we actually care about, right? That's right. And in most of those cases, guess what? Guess what percentage of U.S. foreign direct investment in emerging markets flows to low-income countries? Anyone what? have a guess? 0.07%. So we're not going to find an American investor we can support in the West Bank or in Guinea or Guinea-Bissau or Egypt or Tunisia or any of those difficult places, which is why we work together with AID. One example I'll give you in the Middle East, oh, we've done a number of these programs, but in the West Bank in particular, we got together with AID. AID provided funding to the MEII, the Middle East uh, Economic in, 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 Initiative, to create a, a, a body in the West Bank that was going to work with the nine local banks, Palestinian banks, who would propose loan by loan to this body, and then we would guarantee loan by loan by loan. So we had an AID-funded operation on the ground that was doing technical work to look at every single solitary loan, refer to us, and then we provide a guarantee, a higher guarantee for women-owned businesses, a higher guarantee for rural businesses. In just a few years, we've done 1,000 loans who've created 17,000 jobs and uh, in small and medium enterprises. The default rate is 2%. And guess what? A couple of years later, after this was paid back, the banks came back to us and said, we want to do that again, but this time we want to take more risk because we now understand this SME market. We get how to make loans to them. We're successful in doing it. So OPEC, you can lower your guarantee, and we'll take some of that risk ourselves. We couldn't have done that without AID providing the funding and the technical assistance to create that shop that did the review of each loan. We've done the same program with AID in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Liberia, sorry, not in Liberia, in Haiti, country after country. So I would just say that that combining of uh, grant money to help set something up, pay the technical assistance, manage the program, that enables us to then make a commercial uh, loan proposition is an extremely effective partnership that we're very grateful for. Thank you. So, okay, Luke, so how, what's an appropriate division of labor? How does bio work with the Belgian aid agency, if at all, or how does, how does, how should, how should you all, how should you separate your, your lines of work given okay. this conversation? Um, I'm going to take the example of Congo. It's probably not a coincidence. Belgians mm -hmm. talk about Congo a lot. Um, we have, you know, a fair share of bad conscience about what we did there in the last two or three centuries. So I think we have something to clean up there. Um, take this country. Um, there's been a civil war going on in the eastern part of the country for 20 years. Um, in the rest of the country, only 2% of people have access to electricity. Um, I think the private sector has a huge opportunity there to invest, but it's an investment that's going to take 10, 20, 30 years to really repay itself. 
Uh, in that type of situations, um, the companies that we finance that you know generate the solar energy or that put up the hydro plants, they need good, strong, solid, reliable, long-term contracts to be able to sell the electricity to public utility. Public utilities need to know how to sign these contracts, how to draft them, how to integrate them into public legislation. A country like Congo has none of that. And I think that's one of the examples of the areas where the public money could be so <coughs> hugely useful to help um, national administrations uh, to create this kind of legal frameworks um, to be able for us to do the work. The same thing with land tenure rights. Huh? In Congo, there is no functioning system for land right registration. How can you ever you know, invest in agribusiness <laughs> projects? And that's a role for ODA, right? That's a role for ODA. Bio can't that's do that. That's the role for ODA. ODA we can can't do that. do that. We don't have the time to do that. We don't have the expertise. And also, there's no business case for it. I mean, where we can come in is where the business case becomes interesting because with ODA, this sort of you know, substrate work has been done. All right, so if you're AID, you're the World Bank, you're a bilateral aid agency in Europe, things like helping set up land tenure, which is important so that you can actually do the sorts of agribusiness deals or the sorts of transactions that bio can do, that's an appropriate, that's an appropriate division of labor. Anna, please. Uh, yes, I will really take on the macro uh, perspective on this because what is needed in a country to, uh, to develop private sector development. It's, <coughs> first of all, it's strong institutions, and then it's uh, good infrastructure, and then it's private investments. And I think when we work together, when we really make sure that uh, we build and use the traditional aid to build strong institutions, and we can do the private investments, and the, the people in between, like the development banks, are doing and working with the infrastructure, then we have the possibility to really, really have a very effective way of building <coughs> a strong infra, uh, private sector. And a concrete example of that is that uh, the question of tax. Uh, we work with all our companies to really do the land by land reporting on tax and working with the company. But of course, in some countries, there are not strong enough tax institutions. So working with, for example, CEDA <coughs> to make sure the they... The Swedish aid agency, yeah, exactly, Swedish CEDA. To make sure they build this kind of institution that they are really good at, work with the governments. And the same goes for the ILO's core convention that we uh, require <coughs> all our companies to work with. Then we need someone, sometimes someone working with the government to implement the ILO core convention. And then again, CEDA has an extremely important role. So we can, like, really look at the macro level on the most uh, powerful, uh, <coughs> the LDCs, then we can achieve much more together. I, I Thank you very much. I think um, Shell, Shell Roland, Roland, who's here, who's the head of Norfund, the CEO of the, Nor uh, the Norwegian DFI, tells a very powerful story, and he's told it in several occasions, about Norwe Norway's largest embassy was in Tanzania. and. Uh, when 25 years ago, if the Norwegian ambassador spoke to the health minister or the head of state of Tanzania to get a meeting right away, then I think there was a period, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Shell, but it seemed as if that, that maybe that either not so much Norway, but just say bilateral aid agencies, there's been less, less energy around um, official development assistance as countries have begun to collect their own taxes and finance a lot more of their own development. We did a report called Domestic Resource Mobilization. Others have talked about this and noted this shift in resources even in Africa. But now uh, Shell and Norwegian embassies get a lot more attention, frankly, the same kind of attention they got 15 or 25 years ago when Shell comes to town with an investor saying, we're going to help solve an African country's problem on water. We're going to help solve an African country's challenge on, on power. We're going to help an African country's challenge on infrastructure. And so that this division of labor of embassies, mm. uh, DFIs, investors, is, is bringing a different kind of a conversation and is very valuable. And so that, 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 that is, an, I think, an important thing. And so, uh, so Diana, I'd love for you to talk about, you, you, given that David's given a very interesting, uh, given that you're 100% owned by DFID, you, I think you have a pretty clear sense of, of roles and responsibilities and, and divisions of labor. I'd really be curious your perspective on this topic. Yeah, I mean, it, I think I have a plea, which is 
let's both recognize what we're really good at and stick to it. We can work together very, very well. There are lots of examples at CDC of us working with uh, aid agencies and NGOs to where we know we can't deliver and we need them to help. So it's whether we've made an investment in um, a large financial institution in India where we re we've agreed with management, we really want to ensure that new clients understand what they're taking on and we bring in an NGO to do the financial inclusion training to women. Or we've made an investment in DRC where this is an incredibly poor place, a long, long way from Kinshasa, and the community needs water, so we bring in water aid to do the boreholes. You know, so we really can work together. I think there is a huge danger that with so much money potentially looking at investment now and not, um, not odor, that the aid agencies will want to start making investments themselves. And, and I think it's very dangerous. I think the skills are so very different. So let me just use one example. I'm sure a lot of you are really interested in the nascent uh, off-grid solar market. This could not be a more interesting market long term. The cost of the technology to bring solar to places, particularly in Africa, where the grid will never, well, will not bring electricity for decades is incredibly important and so developmental. But this is such a nascent market. If you are not an experienced investor, if you are a grant maker. So if I'm AID and I decide I want to get into this business. Yes. What, how do you approach it? You basically go to everyone and say, go faster, use cheap capital, please do more. And I'll give you free money. Absolutely. And from an investor's point of view, we've seen this movie before. We've seen these nascent markets go up and down and up and down. And actually what we say is, don't distort the market at this point. Let it go through an experimentation phase. Let there be winners and losers. And we will make sure that the capital to the right players happens at the right time. This okay. is incredibly dangerous. I think, okay, so I want to talk about the issue of climate and energy. And I think this is a good way to segue. So, um, so you know, when I'm... Um, when, you know, my, so if, if I'm the next... Uh, if I go back into government and I'm working on energy and climate at AID, and I decide, well, this is a great idea. I'm going to get $100 million from the US Congress to do off-grid energy. And I'm, so you're trying to tell me is don't, don't go around and just give free, give free solar panels out <laughs> willy-nilly? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> you know, that is really disappointing, because I think there's a whole <laughs> slew of people in this town. You've just basically ruined a whole bunch of people's job prospects for a while. This is this. I'm, I'm very unhappy about, about this, this, Diana. This is very uncomfortable. So no, I think I think you're right. I think this is an important message, though. I think that we want that I think is not talked about uh, enough. So, so okay, Daniela. So, the State Department. I want a two point two part question. So, I, you sit at you're a policymaker. You sit at the State Department. AID doesn't like to think it works for the the State Department, but in somewhat it does. I believe it does. Last time I checked with the org chart, it does. Um, you all think about. OPEC, you think about AID, you think about TDA as a policymaker. So I'd like you to answer this question about division of labor from where you sit. And then I want to go a little bit further. Um, COP21 is something that's been very important to President Obama. We even put windmills on the cover of the report to just signal how I know how important this is. Um, not free windmills. These are development finance windmills. <laughs> but could you talk about, if you would, the climate? I want you to go a little, I want you to react a little bit to Diana's point about Please just don't give out free uh, solar panels willy-nilly. Please don't over-subsidize and screw up the, uh, the, sol the wind market for us with a, a flood of ODA dollars, especially given the pressure from foreign ministries or aid agencies to deliver on climate objectives that may have a different calendar than, say, the calendar that's just been described by my friend at CDC. So I know that's a, those are two complicated questions, but I figured if I if I talked long enough, it would give you enough time to kind of think of think of some clever answers. So good. Thanks, Dan, for the simple simple questions. Simple simple questions. Um, first, on the the div division of labor question, you know, I think always like to keep the big picture in mind here as well, which is as much as our assistance agencies and and DFI and OPIC 
and MCC and uh, TDA and others have an important role to play, uh, they're part of a much bigger market. So our instruments still are a relatively small piece of the pie. And if you really want to take the big picture of US engagement in lower income economies and lower middle income economies, there's also foreign direct investment and trade um, to look at uh, as well, and the, the operations of the multilateral banks, et cetera. So I think when we think about division of labor and the full picture, I think we've increasingly really sought to make sure that um, our diplomats and our um, uh, assistance, our aid professionals and our decision makers are really thinking about policy decisions in that in entire context um, and recognizing where we have a big role or smaller role or otherwise. I think in terms of within um, our direct tools of the, the US government and division of labor, it's clear that we have um, in OPIC an amazing reservoir of talent in terms of understanding how to do deals, understanding private investment, et cetera. And I think uh, we always have been looked to them as um, experts in that area and, and increasingly have, for instance, um, OPIC co-located in our embassies uh, mm. in, in South Africa, in recently in Abidjan, and now in Nairobi. Uh, so I think uh, that has been a real uh, significant value add uh, as well. I, obviously, USAID is a much larger institution, has many different vehicles, grant vehicles, things like development innovation ventures, which help new entities in our global development lab, a, a wide variety of tools, uh, which are largely complementary to OPIC. So largely, I think they have different realms that they, they operate in. Um, and then MCC really as the kind of large scale project financier um, for high performing governments. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, OPIC as the kind of lead with private uh, investment, MCC with kind of large scale projects, and aid as kind of the, really the player who draw, does grant making increasingly in innovative ways uh, to, to advance our development objectives is, is probably the way that I, I would describe it. And there, of course, you know, there's, does that ever, do pieces of that touch each other sometimes and even overlap a bit? Perhaps, but the market is sufficiently big, um, and the overlaps um, not so significant that I, uh, that it doesn't, I think, um, create a huge crowding of our our market. But I do think it's really important to understand what the distinct talent and expertise mm -hmm. of each of our institutions are in order to to have them work well together. On the very separate question of how do we fund <laughs> climate change um, and uh, you know, I, look, I, I don't think I can answer exactly how we should structure our financing of solar or wind, right? Um, but I do think that uh, we've been, uh, and OPIC has been, a, for instance, has been a significant funder of um, clean energy projects, and that's been a really critical tool of our global climate change initiative. But I do think it is going to be, I think the climate community recognizes that the big dollars here are private investment dollars, I mean, by, by a long shot. Um, it, and so I think really the challenge we have, both in climate and in other areas of the sustainable development goals, is not all, just how do we kind of use assistance better or even our DFIs to catalyze, but how do we get this market to operate, in, how do we get these markets to operate in a way that start bending the curve and uh, enable us to really address climate? So I think we have to think about incentives. Um, and get those right. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want to ask each of you about climate, uh, but I, I just want to make a comment about, about both Daniela and Elizabeth. I think you have two of the most capable public servants that we have in the Obama administration up here, and I just want to recognize that they both are doing an excellent job. And uh, I want to say earlier about many policymakers don't know the difference between equity and equity. Daniela actually does know the difference between equity and equity. Uh, and that it's, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, such good people like uh, Elizabeth and Daniela in the government right now, and I'd include people like Lee Zak as well and as part of that when I think of, of really good public servants. So thank you for, for your public service, but also thanks for your answer to those two cha challenging questions. Luke. Yeah, I think if there's one thing the development community has learned is throwing money 
um, grant money at things is mm -hmm. not the best way to solve problems. And that was all already in the aid context as well. People See, I think that's a lesson we have to relearn and relearn because I think there's yes. a temptation every time there's a G7 meeting or a G20 deliverable or a UN deliverable, yeah. some clever person in a foreign yeah. ministry says, well, I need my head of state is going to give a speech. And so I need to come up with a, a chunk of money that I can announce as a talking point. And yeah. So I don't disagree with you, but I, it seems to me that there are pressures not in the DFIs, but in the foreign ministries and the aid ministries yeah. to do you know, policy by deliverable. And so yeah. the next thing you know, there's a billion dollar uh, soft money fund or for, to do X or yeah. Y. So I agree with you. Yeah, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm a bit optimistic there, but I think, you know, in the DFI world, at least I get quite uneasy at all these huge amounts, you know, these billions to trillions, as if, you know, that's the best way to go forward. But on the other hand, and there I, I, I disagree a bit with Diana, the fact that now the aid community is looking into private sector investment is also a huge opportunity, because then we can talk to them about our mechanisms and about um, the way, you know, you, you can link uh, input and output and mm -hmm. outcomes and impact and all these jargons that they are using because our theory of change is very simple huh? it's very simple I and think it's, it's based a different theory on of change. you know what Adam Smith discovered already three centuries ago it's about putting money into where people feel they can use their entrepreneurial skills to create prosperity and create you know livelihoods that are viable and that are uh, you know that are sustainable in the long run and I think that business model, if, if DFIs can clarify that there, there is a, a direct link between using that model and creating you know, a better way uh, to do economic development than just throwing money at it, I think this opportunity now is bigger there than ever. You know, in some ways, as I'm listening to this conversation, it, makes, it harkens back to after 9-11, I would say that the, uh, the defense and national security and straight up foreign policy community got a lot, lot, lot more interested in ODA and pure development. And there was sort of a really tight and warm embrace that hadn't historically been there. I would, being a little simplistic here, but it seems to me that I think historically I'd say folks who operated in the tradition, not, this isn't totally correct, but there was a little bit of a sense that if we could just be kind of left alone over here doing our development stuff, and we could send you guys a postcard <laughs> once a year and tell you what we've been up to, that would be okay. But all, after 9-11, this stuff became a lot more important. So a little bit to Luke's point about the good news is that you all aren't obscure acronyms anymore because your ODA friends have said, oh my gosh, this is great. The private sector development agenda, Addis Ababa, SDGs, billions to trillions is an opportunity as well as a headache in the sense that some folks are saying, well, we're just going to drop a billion dollars of free money and we're going to solve this using, we're going to, we're going to crowd in the private sector with some free money. Uh, at the same time, it's saying, well, hey, we need to actually bring some of these people to the table because you actually kind of know what you're talking about, right? So I think it, I actually think it is similar to from 15 years ago when the traditional aid community all of a sudden they said, hey, there's this thing called Afghanistan and a lot of the problems in Afghanistan are going to be solved with interventions that walk and quack like traditional development interventions, but we're going to do it looking at it through a national security foreign policy lens. There's a lot of the traditional aid community saying we need to solve a lot of development problems, but the, the solutions are going to walk and quack like the kinds of interventions DFIs have been doing for 30 or 40 years. And so it is a, both a challenge and an opportunity. And so that's, I think the, the report is timing that way. So Elizabeth, can I ask you to, to come into this conversation about, I want each of you to talk about climate as well and energy because it was one of the areas that we identified as one of the things that you guys are going to be given a lot more homework assignments on. And so could you talk about what, what's in your energy inbox and climate inbox right now at, at OPIC? Uh, sure. And then I'll touch on the, the national security yeah, piece, please, too, please because do that. that's something we spend a lot of uh, time on. So on the climate front, I think everyone uh, here knows that we've made uh, renewable energy a major priority uh, in the last couple of years. We've done um, a little over $8 billion in financing in the last five years of renewable energy projects, mainly in Africa. And of course, every dollar that we're investing is accompanied by oftentimes two or as much as three of private money. So that's a big, a big check. Um, and it's everything from wind to solar to biogas to hydro, geothermal, um, all throughout the continent. And what's been very exciting is to see how quickly that's growing. It's the area, you know, when we, when we talk often, and we talked to get, about yesterday about it, the banks are pulling out of emerging markets. We've seen developers actually coming in to this sector and coming in with enthusiasm. So I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm a little nervous when I see tariffs coming down so low 
that it's hard to see how you can viably finance that. There's some, uh, there's some renewable energy programs that have come down so low that frankly you need concessional finance. Mm. So I think that's gonna create some confusion in the market. But leaving that aside, I think um, the, the private sector is ready to do more in this space and we're extremely proud of what we've been able to do. We've grown the portfolio you know, 100 fold. Um, and I could give a million hundred examples. fold. Yes, since 2008. Okay. So, and um, I could give a number of examples of Please. how we've done. Well, I'll just actually just mention one because it ties into how eight agencies in OPIC are working together. Um, last week, at the, in, at the in the margins of the Africa Business Forum, we signed and signed and actually committed uh, a financing for the largest wind farm in West Africa, the the, the first in Senegal, ever. And it's an interesting example of the President's Power Africa initiative, which yeah. I think has been actually very successful in bringing unprecedented coordination amongst uh, USG agencies and real transaction specific technical assistance and, and forcing a division to of advance labor. real projects. Yeah. Great division of labor uh, in that regard. And it's brought new developers to the table that weren't coming before. So in this case, this was a wind farm that benefited from early stage grant support thanks to the State Department through the Africa Clean Energy Finance Program to pay for out-of-pocket expenses that the developer wasn't able to handle. They then moved on and worked with AID's tech transaction advisors who helped the, 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 the power utility, Senelec, figure out how are they gonna handle the first intermittent power they'd ever accepted onto the grid. And that was then handed over to the ambassador who did a huge amount of advocacy and lobbying for things like the proper licenses and <coughs> enabling environment uh, changes. And then it was handed over to OPIC, who then provided several hundred million dollars of financing uh, and insurance that's going to end up reducing the power by 50% and adding 25% more power to the grid in that country. It wouldn't have happened without the State Department's early stage finance, without AID's advice, and, it would, and then OPIC's financing after. So for me, that's a great example of, uh, of, of how the agencies can divide up the labor. I've talked too much, so maybe I'll come back no, later good. on the national security. No, actually, let me let me pivot to national security. I would like each of you to talk about. I mean, I can just list. You want to on climate. climate? Yeah, okay, climate. <laughs> You're Swedish, right? So you yes. guys love climate. I'm, I'm yes. guessing. Yes, and that's a top yeah, yeah. priority. Yes, top I need priority. To comment on that. Of course, now. of course. So. Please go ahead, Anna. Okay, so a number of things. Uh, first of all, the same goes for Svedfan. We are really focusing right now on renewable. And I what think percent of your portfolio is in renewable right now? Uh, it's still small, but okay. uh, looking at the investment this year, it's uh, uh, nearly 30% of the investment. 30% yeah. of this year's it, investment yeah. is going to be renewable. Yes. So, uh, uh, but what we have done is, uh, what you see is when a renewable project are already bankable, there is so much money. So what we have tried to see instead is like, how can we really support the developers so we have actually had a much more uh, risk appetite, if you say so. Yep. And we need to be more long term if we are going to open up the market and make sure that they are made in a financial viable way. I think we need to find these developers that are really good and are able to unlock that potential. So I think that is a very important learning from us. Uh, secondly, I'm extremely uh, proud to be part of uh, the common EDFI facility, ICCF, because I think that is probably one of the most efficient facility uh, that uh, exists when it comes to climate investments, where we have uh, decided to pool our resources uh, and one DFI take the lead in the in investment. So that is also a very good thing. So this is EDFI doing collaborative investments together via sort of the EDFI vehicle to do that. Exactly. exactly. It's great. It's very, very good. Uh, and that was one thing I could, had the opportunity to tell at the Finance for Development Conference in Addis that these type of facilities actually already do exist. So how can we scale them up? So yeah. having NOR fund, SWED fund, Fin Fund, it's Bio, OPIC, yeah. CDC. We had a breakfast this morning and we had, I don't know, 10 or 12 CEOs around the table. I don't know, C CGD had a title of their sort of $50 billion in one room. I don't know if there's $50 billion in this room, but there's probably close to $50 billion in this room. So having EDFI create vehicles or opportunities for you all to work together is very powerful yeah. and, and is a great opportunity. So not only do you have to work intra-agency with your AODA, 
partners, or and you do this already. Oftentimes, you'll work collaboratively. Or you have a cooperation model between. And you. it's also extremely efficient since we now all have the same harmonizing standards. Mm. So we know how to work together. Mm. And that is my third point, that uh, talking about climate and COP21, it's not only about renewable. It's really how do we work in all sectors with uh, making sure they are energy efficient, mm -hmm. making sure that uh, they have a good water treatment plant, making sure that they use the, the right type of energy. And I think we have uh, the system and the indicators to push all sectors, even if it's uh, manufacturing services or financial institutions, to really deliver on the SDG number seven on climate. So Kay. that is another point. How do we talk about climate? It's not only renewable, it's extremely important, but we can do so much on all sectors. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna pivot, because I know you guys all love climate, <laughs> and I think it's, uh, but I think I wanna talk about some of the other sectors you guys are gonna be asked to work in. I, I wanna come back, I wanna talk about national security. So I'm just gonna list some places. Georgia, Ukraine, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Egypt, Tunisia, uh, the Sahel, the Maghreb, the Horn, uh, Northern Triangle, so it's El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. I see my friend at uh, Cofides is here from Spain, so I know that's a big focus for Spanish DFIs. So I want you each to tell me a story about, let's call it a Let's call it a region or a country of interest. We have in the US this term for like, if you're not a criminal or you're a suspect, we don't say you're a suspect, you say you're a person of interest. So let's call it a country of interest or a person of interest or a region of interest. We'll leave it at that. But for a variety of reasons, these are, these are places, and I could name some others, that get a lot more attention for a variety of reasons that don't necessarily have to do with developmental challenges but have to do with other things. So I'd like each of you to tell me a story other than a climate, non, I want a non-energy or climate story. I want you to tell me something about agriculture or water. I want you to tell me something about roads. I want you to tell me about jobs. I want you to tell me a story about one of those, one of these kind of tougher places that has sort of a national security optic. Diana, let me start with yeah, you. I'm very happy to do that. Um, we're really pushing the envelope of risk. And you heard from my shareholder this morning. It's great when you have an informed, thoughtful shareholder. You can have really good conversations about how far can you push and what's doable and what isn't doable. So the last five years, we built a portfolio where over 40% is in what we would call fragile and conflict-affected uh, states. So this is pushing the envelope. So my story would be an investment we made in uh, DRC, and I'm delighted that Bruno's here because uh, DEG, because this is a collaborative uh, investment with some of our DFI uh, colleagues. And this is hard, this is properly hard. So let me paint the picture. It's um, a uh, palm oil plantation that was established by Unilever over 100 years ago. So this is all brownfield, there's no clearing the land inappropriately or anything like that. Um, to get to this place, this is not Kinshasa. If you don't take a private plane, you actually get on a boat in Kinshasa, which is what the locals do, it takes weeks to get to this place. Okay? If you live there, there is no prospect of employment, none, unless you work on this plantation. Okay? There are 40,000 people whose livelihoods completely depend on this. We only invested, though, because we <coughs> think there is a chance of making this a sustainable business. We wouldn't go near it otherwise. That's absolutely part of our mission. This is not giving out grant money. So there is a thesis here that says you invest in this plantation, you re rehabilitate it, you put fertilizer <coughs> on, you plant, and over time, you create a business that generates positive cash flow. But this is going to be hard. You've got to replace a boiler that's a century old, you've got to get the parts down, everything takes longer there. But this we consider, and that be clear, our portfolio is not made up of all of investments that look like this. This is right at one end <laughs> of the spectrum. But we look at it and we say, yeah, we're, we're here to do these kinds of investments. This really matters. This really matters. Okay. Anna, give me an example of a country of interest. 
Can it be any country or it can it be any country, but it's got to have a national security or geopolitical oh. spin to it. Because I want to give another. <laughs> okay. Uh, I can't say no. I'd have to. How am I going to say no? No, because Anna? Uh, the reason I want to give this example uh, is that I think it uh, leverages so many parts, uh, and it's for me it's par uh, partnership is the new leadership, and I think this is a good uh, example how we can really drive a total sector, uh, and it's a uh, partnership in the textile industry. Okay. Uh, where we partner up with uh, the most sustainable uh, textile industry Kay. production plant in Which probably Bangladesh. employs hundreds of thousands the of DBL. people. This is a factory in, in uh, Bangladesh. And we have an agreement with uh, the retailer H&M. And we are now building a totally vi uh, vertical uh, production plant in Ethiopia. Uh, where we have together set all the industry standards and all the uh, sustainability indicators. Ethiopia is the Horn of Africa, so this counts. That's good. It okay. counts in my okay. area. Okay, right. thank you. Thank yeah, you, yeah. then. Uh, so what we're trying to achieve here is to really take the learnings from Asia and think about how can we be part of creating a sustainable and profitable textile industry in Africa by showing a good example so all the different partners, we are uh, investors together with the uh, Bangladesh company, and H&M have agreed to buy the volumes the first five years. So we really get a uh, much more rapidly uh, movement uh, where we can show a best practice example in Ethiopia. And already now there are so many other investors that are looking into the case and want to do more in the textile industry, not only in Ethiopia, but also in African countries. And I think this is a really powerful role of the DFI to put an example on the ground and show others that it's actually possible to do it both in a financial viable way, mm -hmm. but also in a sustainable way. Okay. So I think that, uh, that is the reason, and we have been working a lot with the civil society organization on this case. Great, Elizabeth. So, <clears throat> over a third of OPEC's portfolio is in conflict-affected countries right now. Countries of interest. Mm -hmm. So those are all countries of interest. Mm -hmm. So we have stories <laughs> in Egypt, we have stories of Afghanistan, Iraq, you name it, even South Sudan, where I went right after the first piece I heard agreement. Juba's lovely in October. It was, well, they, <laughs> there's no place to stay, so that's the investment we yes. made was in a, the first business hotel there. Yeah. But you mentioned textiles, so I'll just give you one, a couple of examples. One of my favorite in, in one of our projects in Afghanistan, and we have about 20. They've done relatively well also. You have 20 projects in Afghanistan. Yes. One of them is Good. two gentlemen from the textile industry in Atlanta, charming old gentlemen, but in their, oh, I shouldn't say tell how old they are. Not, well, okay, I won't tell you how old they are. <laughs> really wanted to help you know, build the women of Afghanistan mm -hmm. and give them opportunities. So they went, they identified the opportunity, they built a textile mill to make uh, uniforms for the Afghan police and army. They recruited women, many of them were widows, and finally at the end were employing 500 women, first time they'd ever worked outside the home to make these uniforms. And now they're actually exporting to H&M in the UK. Mm -hmm. So Sorry. that's a story of 500 women who wouldn't have had that opportunity were it not for these two right. gentlemen and the financing that we provided. But I want to tell a, a, another story, not the, about a specific project, but about a country, uh, and that is uh, Jordan. Yep. Mm. You look at Jordan, and that country has been an incredible, strong, bold, brave force against extremism in the region, yep. and is today. And yet, they are the most, fifth most water insecure country on the planet Earth. They have none of their own natural resources, and they have over a million Syrian refugees that have come in, creating a big boost in their, in their population. The pipeline from Egypt where they got their power was blown up so consistently that it's now, now effectively shut and all the power they were, the, the fueling the power plants was diesel trucks coming every day all the way from Aqaba, 360 kilometers to Amman. That's how they're getting their power. So this is a, main, a huge priority for the U.S. foreign policy, as you know. So we focused a lot on, on Jordan. We now have about a billion dollars in portfolio there, uh, ranging from uh, a water transportation from an aquifer down in the south in Man, all the way up to Amman that's providing about a quarter of the water to Amman. A power plant that we did together with EVRD, in fact, 
that's providing a quarter of the power in the whole country. Uh, SME programs, SME lending programs like the one I mentioned earlier that we're doing in partnership with USAID that's, great. that's employing Syrian refugees. So that's the kind of way you can take a holistic approach to a country and push as hard as you possibly can to encourage US, AES in this case, to think about that country rather than another country when they're bidding on power plants, for example. So I think just in general, I know I talk a lot on the Hill to make the case for why foreign direct investment is such a powerful part of our national security agenda. And I think, frankly, the military and the defense community has been an incredibly powerful voice in this, in making the case that a dollar's worth of aid is worth three dollars worth of military later down the road. And I think you know what we talk about is how the lack of hope and opportunity abroad, much less fear and rage abroad, knows no borders and is a threat to us at home. Mm. So the more you can work on projects like this that are creating jobs, that are creating power, that are creating the basics that people need, uh, that does create stability in these markets, which is crucially important to us. So we feel like our projects are real live, business to business, person to person partnerships that actually are based on mutual understanding, mutual respect, shared prosperity, and it takes of our businesses, it transforms them into ambassadors mm -hmm. that demonstrate the absolute best of American or Swedish or British skills, innovation, <laughs> intentions, and goodwill. Yeah. So it's an incredibly powerful foreign policy tool. And last, I would say, you know, can you think of a better foreign policy tool than to have, say, an American and an Egyptian company working together on something that's creating Egyptian jobs and is investing in the very things the Egyptian people want most from their own government, which is power, which is clean water, which is low-income housing, and jobs. jobs yeah. So that is an incredibly powerful, tangible, visible way of showing what we're all about in our foreign policy. I think it's, it's very hard to go to Capitol Hill and talk to elected members of the House of Representatives or members of the Senate and say, well, you need to do more with OPIC because it's in the Addis Ababa Financing for Development mm -hmm. document. I'm sure you've read it, Mr. Senator. It's not, that's not going to sell. It's, it's this stuff. It's, this is what's going to sell OPIC, at, at least in the U.S. context. It's gonna, and, you know, for better or for worse, the develop, much of the development conversation has a is looked at through a variety of other lenses. And so this is also one of the lenses in which that shareholders in the United States, stakeholders in the United States, are going to look at DFIs. And so this is an important part of, of that conversation. So I think it's important that we, we raise it. Luke, does this, is this, is this happen in Belgium yeah, for you? Yeah, maybe picking up on your point, which I really appreciate. About, you know, it's very good that people start looking at these countries from a national security perspective. But in fact, uh, you should also start and seeing it from the perspective that actually the people we're talking about are. Um, we've, I'm, I'm going to take you to Tunis, and we've taken some of our top State Department people to spend 48 hours in a Tunis slum. And we said, this is the way you're going to understand, and this is what, what they, they said themselves, now I understand why this is a breeding ground for IS. You know, there, mm. there is so much hopelessness there. Yeah, but that's the way it is. I mean, that's what you have to, to, to be realistic about. And, I think the project that I can mention there is um, we work together with an investment fund there to supply private equity to set up a, um, a professional training college. There are none in uh, Tunis. There are some state universities where people learn, um, well, they still, I think they still learn Marxism there. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure how it's going to help them. <laughs> but um, w there's a, the group of people there um, that have set up this professional training school. And I think what I highly appreciate with them is one, they work with the government. Uh, I think it's very important that you take the government of these countries seriously. And there is a government in Tunisia mm. that is halfway legitimate and that is trying to improve its, its democratically country. elected. We should link to their policies. Two, they engaged um, major international ICT companies to join in the effort. So in the professional college, you'll find a Samsung corner, you'll find a Google corner, you'll find an Apple corner. That's great. And uh, for these companies, it's interesting because there they can recruit you know, top quality young people to uh, develop their businesses in Northern Africa. Mm. And I think the third element I liked about this school is that they found a business model where they can have people who have nothing except their intelligence and uh, you know, some proof of their scholarship to join in these colleges. They pay, I don't know, $10, maybe $20 mm -hmm. a year to be able to be there. Others will pay four or 5,000. They found a, a way of mixed financing to make this happen. 
Within five years, there are 6,000 youngsters there. And mm. um, you get tears in your eyes when you see that. And you see 6,000 youngsters, which five years ago had no professional future for them whatsoever. Whereas a lot of them certainly would have been very welcome targets for ICIS propaganda. You're seeing them now developing their own businesses. They have set up um, a sort of a spin-off uh, startup business center where they get the support from Apple and Google and Samsung. Uh, some of these people are going off on internships in international companies abroad. Um, with, and I, th I think also that's very interesting, with the promise that they will come back to their own country and use what they've learned abroad, use some of the capital that our investment fund um, makes available to them to start and setting up businesses in their country. The one thing we have to learn is to be patient about all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, the EU is now has this program of anti-immigration investment where they think that sort of in six months time throwing a billion dollars at this problem will sort of solve it. No, this is taking five, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but if you have that patience, I'm sure you know that the wind will be on all sides. Daniel, do you want to comment on this issue of national security? You're sitting in probably a lot of interesting meetings, whether it's the White House or the National Security Council or at the State Department, where you're thinking about national security issues. And how does this conversation come into that? Yeah, um, I mean, I think really excellent examples here. And I'll pick up on Jordan, um, where Elizabeth touched on. And particularly, I think in Jordan, you see a challenge that you see in the region and in Africa, which is the refugee crisis, and, and you've touched on migration as well. And I think the opportunity to, I mean, when we look at the global refugee crisis now, which is the you know largest number of refugees since World War II, and it is which is front and center on the policy agenda, we know the two big needs, education and employment uh, for refugee populations. And refugee populations are now, on average, spending a decade <laughs> as refugees, not just a year or two. Uh, so I think the solutions that are, and this is where the nexus of DFIs and, devel mm. and development institutions really happens, but opportunities for small medium enterprises, opportunities for education uh, and training that DFIs can play a really important part of, I think is really a, a place where there's both a very significant need for the type of skills and tools that DFIs have, and also puts DFIs centrally in a very uh, significant and top of mind foreign policy conversation. Thank you. Can Elizabeth I jump in on this and ask a yeah. question? I mean, we'll if, I, if I might, we probably mm -hmm. both. I bet we're going to say the same thing, you know? Yeah, maybe. So great try. minds think alike. <laughs> yes. No, I think, I think this is a great example of, of just what, what, what the value was of this report, because I think you guys did a terrific job of showing what the DFIs can do and what we shouldn't be pushed to do. So for me, the refugee crisis situation is an example, and that's the question I wanted to ask all of you, where we probably can't play as much of a role as people think we can because there's three things you need for microfinance or small and medium or any kind of finance with a population like that. They need to be stable, they need to be, there needs to be security, and there needs to be a, 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 no, no longer a barter system, but currency. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't lend money to that, that population. So the question I have is, is this an example of where we should say clearly, this is a clear example of where we have to define the roles and say, we do commercially based finance, and ODA agencies need to focus on this refugee crisis. They need more resources and more people to do so. Or am I missing something? And there yeah, is something we can be doing. Luke, Anna, and Diana, since you guys are continental, you know, you're, you're European, not necessarily continental, but you're European ADA, uh, DFIs. Could you talk about how you're being asked to respond to the global refugee crisis? Because I'm sure each of you have been asked that question. What are you doing to help solve this problem? Anna, why start with you? No, short comment. I just, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I spent time in Jordan, uh, both in the Satara camp, which has 80,000 refugees from yeah. Syria. So uh, it's one of the largest camps in the world. Uh, but my findings, I were there with the uh, UN Foundations, Global Entrepreneurship Council. My findings were quite interesting because there is a lot of support for the Syrian ref refugees. And UNHCR are doing a great job. And so many other UN agencies are doing a great job, UNDP and so on. Yeah. But the interesting part were we spent some time with the extreme uh, uh, p uh, people from Jordan living in extreme poverty. And what you can see there is yeah. that we, can't, we shouldn't miss the holistic picture. 
we can play a role to make sure that we don't start an economic conflict between Syrian people and refugees exactly. and, and Jordan people. people. Living there. So what we should focus on is job creation in general. Exactly. Really supporting the country right now at this really, really fragile um, time to support them with energy investments, right. support them with our what we are best in doing. And that is an extremely important learning ex uh, for me because when I came there, I was so focused on what can we do, can we do for the for refugees. refugees. Right. And we should ask ourselves, how can we really do more right now in this time? In that community, in that geography. Jordan, so both yeah. the refugees and the Jor people you can join join our, our, You can join our SME program in oh, great. Jordan. Okay, <laughs> that sounds great. So, okay, Diana, could you, you must be being asked by your shows, what can you do to help us solve the global refugee crisis? Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of what we've been talking about on this panel has been about distinction of responsibilities between different actors. And I think the migration crisis puts it into sharp relief. Yeah. Um, the aid agencies, it's all about humanitarian and the immediate and the here and now, and that's what they're perfect for. DFIs are, are more about the long term creating the environment in countries that make them want to stay. Mm. We, we use the word hopelessness. It's a, absolutely the right one. If you yeah. live in a country where you can't turn the light on, your children can't go to a good school, when they get to the end of their schooling, however long that is, they can't get a job, if they can't get good health care, this is what creates the environment for hope, hopelessness and therefore migration. Now, all of us together, and if we're pushed to invest in harder countries where this is the greatest problem, we can definitely make an inroad into this, but this is long-term stuff. Mm -hmm. Luke, do you but want to comment on this? <laughs> yeah. we'll just bring I think in. in terms of change, yeah, because you asked what's been changing, the interesting thing is my minister, who loves all these countries, mm -hmm. I think of the 14 partner countries of the Belgian cooperation, 12 are countries of interest, countries as you of call interests. them. Huh? Uh, but instead of taking on uh, the director of the Belgian aid agency, he, he now has me coming along. Uh, and so I think the, the change of mindset there is very clear. Huh? He's looking at economic development to solve some of these crises. Mm. Um, I'm on my way with him, always telling him what we can't do, because I think that is a very important message to keep mm -hmm. telling. You know, we can't solve this crisis for you in six months. But if you can guarantee politically some sort of stability, uh, people only invest if they have some sort of foreseeable future for themselves. Mm -hmm. If they don't know if they're going to be in the same place again three months from now, it's no use. But if you can provide some sort of stability in refugee camps or whatever, you can start off, and this is the, the type of work we do a lot, is, you know, uh, microfinance, but especially for micro and small businesses, <coughs> no personal loans from businesses, uh, get some business incubation in from the side of the, the, the aid people, and have us really make sure that the, 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 the commercial focus of the entrepreneurial side mm. uh, is developed. And you then work for two or three, four years within a relatively stable context. I think things can be done. That's possible. Yeah. Okay. So you all have been a very patient audience. I'd love to hear from two or three. I'm happy to call on folks if I don't see some hands. Um, so this gentleman here with the, the tie, this woman back here, this gentleman here, let's do those three, and then this, this gentleman here, these four. Okay, so this guy with a great tie. <laughs> and this woman here, and then this Thank gentleman. And, <clears throat> no, thanks uh, a lot name for uh, organization. My name is uh, Morten Lauritsen, and I'm with the uh, IFC. And until recently, I was... Uh, with the Danish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs for okay. 20 years. I love that cable channel. It's really great. I watch it all the time. You do that. Exactly. <laughs> That's good. Um, and I think my, my question really comes back also to, to what I've been doing before, working with CIA, SIS on, on uh, global governance in economic affairs. And, and I think if, if you look through this report, it really has some excellent numbers. And I think also some eye-openers, for example, that the the outstanding uh, assets of the Chinese banks are bigger than the six uh, multilateral banks uh, together. I think that that really pushes us also to think about where, where the world is, is going. But, but my question is, uh, how, how can we kind of combine the agendas more? Because if you are in, a, let's say, an OECD discussion on economics, 
we, we discussed the sluggish uh, growth in Europe and uh, the lack of productivity, etc. And some of these new SDG goals really comes into the heart of how you can also create economic growth by connectivity, by infrastructure investments, etc. So how, how, how can, uh, if you look forward as uh, DFIs, how can you, you see the role evolving as kind of being part of that discussion in, 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 the, in the economic growth of the world uh, lenses? And I know it's an abstract uh, question, uh, question but, but really what pushes me is if you add up the, the numbers here, we're not going to mobilize the, the money needed to, to finalize yeah. the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you. So let this woman over here, name and organization, please. Hi, um, I'm Lauren Cork. I work for Pan-African Capital Group here in DC. Um, and I was interested to hear a bit more. Um, we are currently raising a $50 million fund in Liberia. And we've approached several DFIs and heard that um, the fund's great. It falls in line with the, the goals that many of you had stated today, but we don't meet the minimum investment. And so I was interested to hear a bit more about what DFIs are doing to grapple with this discrepancy between minimum investments and, and needs for commercial returns, but also understanding that many of these economies, these small, more fragile economies that are beyond pure ODA and ready for that catalytic investment are not ready to absorb um, the size of investment that, that many DFIs require. Um, and so I'd like to hear, we've heard a bit from the CDC about what they're doing to, to grapple with this. And um, Daniel, you touched on this earlier, calling for the need for DFIs to recognize the need for smaller, riskier, more resource intensive inv investments. But um, understanding really what 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 is being done to move in that direction. Okay, thanks. This gentleman here. Yes, my name is Darnley Howard. I'm a consultant with Advanta International, and um, there are a number of regional organizations. I'm thinking in particular of the African Union through their uh, NEPAD initiative, who where developing countries are expressing what they're interested in and in terms of their own development and what they feel their priorities are. And I'm wondering what, to what extent the DFIs and, and the ODAs are having dialogue with those, ki <clears throat> with those kinds of organizations and, and how, if so, how you found that dialogue to be. Great, and then this gentleman over here, there's a gentleman here, yes. You have the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. You got to, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Kilian Doe with the World Justice Project here in DC and I was just wondering to come back to this discussion about what DFIs can and cannot do, and then uh, also the discussion around stability in countries for long-term investment and long-term planning, what kind of initiatives they are to fund projects to guarantee sound investment and commercial returns. So around rule of law, for example, to guarantee access to electricity, access to energy, how much DFIs are willing to invest in those types of projects to then guarantee that energy projects that come after have a sound planning structure and can really deliver in countries where it's harder to guarantee the return for people in energy projects. Okay, I want my friend Stephen Jordan. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, good morning. Stephen Jordan with IO Sustainability. We are opening uh, business incubators in both Turkey and in Latin America. And the Turkish project is really kind of targeted at uh, the southern border uh, with the Syrian refugees. One of the things that, that we're interested in understanding is what is the relationship between the DFIs, venture capital, and intermediary organizations like local chambers of commerce, like in, uh, incubators? Is there, is there like an escalator path? Like, um, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about uh, with the Syrian refugees is they're trying to develop not just entrepreneurship, but franchise opportunities. Oh, how can we uh, do a handoff? Okay. How, does, how, would, how would those kind of handoffs work? Okay, great. So those are a lot of questions, so you don't have to answer all five, but I'm hoping each of you will touch on one of the five. I'm particularly interested in Stephen's question about franchises and packages. So I'd be interested if any of you have ever provided any financing for, fin for franchising opportunities in particular, but th that's not exactly Steve's point, but that's mm -hmm. part of it. So I'd be interested in that. So any, uh, each of you could, would take a crack. Why don't I start with you, Elizabeth? Do you want to? 
<clears throat> sure. Um, I'll, I'll just say a word about a couple of these. But you know, in general, I think there's one thing that we haven't talked about that several of your questions touched upon, and your question too, what has changed? And I think what we're really seeing is that in the last 10 years, businesses are investing in things that were once the exclusive domain of government budgets and aid agencies. You think about it, the first, we're, in many cases, we're doing the first ever independent power project in the countries in Africa. The government used to do power projects. Now the businesses are doing it. In other countries, businesses are investing in elementary schools and making it profitable to, to educate children. And IFC has been a big investor in slum schools, providing technical assistance for right. 15 years. <laughs> the right thing to do. <clears throat> Health clinics, et cetera. So more and more and more, we're seeing that all of these things that were once social sectors that was done by government budgets, businesses are investing in them now and finding business models, thanks to technology, thanks to lower costs, that are viable. So that's actually what's driving this growth more than anything else. Anyway, maybe it's a statement of the obvi obvious, but I feel like we don't say it enough. And on the question of Liberia, actually, I just came back from my second trip there. I led a post-Ebola investor trip to Liberia because it's really hard to get investors to look at the small countries, particularly in West Africa, not because they're poor, but because they're so small. Why would you set up in Liberia? There's no market. People don't have disposable income. It's not easy to move around in the region because there's no networks, either rail or airlines. So that's the challenge in those small countries is that the, the, the mere size prevents you from being able to attract investment. But um, two ways that we've responded to that, first of all, we will do transactions as small as a million uh, and all the way up to, to very large sizes when we think it's highly developmental, highly catalytic, and will lead to something later. But we also realize that our toolkit doesn't really go very deep in the earlier stage, riskier uh, projects. So there's a point at which oh, uh, grants are no longer appropriate, but DFIs aren't yet appropriate. Hmm. So we've taken an approach by, uh, by do it, taking a portfolio approach and providing short-term, small-scale uh, support to earlier stage projects who we believe on, a on, a, on an un unrisk correlated portfolio basis will do fine. And that's our, it's called our Portfolio of Impact Project, and you might want to look for it on our, on our website. We basically took 50 million of our capital, put it over there, and said this is for early stage stuff. Um, <clears throat> And on the franchising yeah. question, you know, we found that franchising is very, very, very pro popular in places like Tunisia, where you have a well-educated population that wants to jumpstart a, a business, wants to get into it quickly, um, and they see it as a, a less risky way than starting their own business. So, in fact, in response to uh, the Tunisian, uh, what the events in Tunisia, uh, we actually have just put, mounted a franchising facility to provide uh, capital for franchisees. And we've done this in a number of countries throughout the world as well. Great. Diana? I'd like to take the uh, small investment question, because I think it's a really profound question, actually, um, given the amount of capital that's coming our way. Um, I sat on a panel yesterday, and I told a story about an old CDC investment we made in 1964, where after 20 years, this company, which was a, a tea development authority in Kenya, after 20 years, it was the largest exporter of tea in the world. It was uh, supporting three million uh, livelihoods in Kenya, uh, and um, you know, ama amazing results. And the amount of money that went into that in the first five years was less than a million dollars. But what was, how was it done? It was done by one or two people from CDC being sent to Kenya for two to three years to figure out whether this was possible. And when I think about that, and I think about the amount of money that we have to invest, it's really, really hard for us organizations to put that amount of effort in human capital into making things happen. And it's so much a theme of mine that it's not capital, really, that makes the difference. It's about skills and people, and it's a great story for that. So how are we trying to address that? We have put a small team together now to say, and said to them, try and do those kinds of things. Um, we've hired people who are not investors, they're business builders, and they understand and they're really experienced about how hard it is to build businesses in very difficult places. They've got lots and lots of scars, and they're extremely commercial because it's all about can it work. Mm. Um, and we've said to them, doesn't matter how long it takes, doesn't matter how much you invest, it's all about trying to do that really, you know, that really hard thing. But you're right. I mean, in lots of cases, things come to us and we say, we cannot justify 
this small check for the amount of money, for the amount of effort it's going to take. And I think it's true for all of us. So yeah. I'm going to take the knee pad question, the regional groupings question. What was that? <laughs> working with, do you work with knee pad? Do you work, you know, the very, do you work, you with, work with, the with the African Union? Do you work no. with Mercosur? Any, do you all work with any of those <laughs> folks? I don't, I don't get the sense. I think the answer to that is no. <laughs> no. Mainly, mostly, yeah. I yeah think mainly I'm sure. Can well, I say a point yeah. on that? Yes, knowing what Nick that is. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that that question, though, speaks to I, where, you know, we're if you look at what NAPAD and other and the AU and others have put forward in terms of what they hope to achieve in agriculture and property reduction, it all speaks to private sector development and investment at a high level. But th I think the opportunity is to start bringing those kind of plans to what, where the it's DFI, a good idea. the yeah. DFI tools contribute to it. And I think it's kind of like it's a, it's an interesting for insight or sustainable development goals. They, they don't tell you what to do, but they do give a political will and a frame that if you can demonstrate how your tools are contributing to them, it gives you extra political will and um, opportunity. So next year at the next African Union Summit, you all, you all may be showing, be invited as part of the official delegations. But, no, but honestly, I think that is one of the most important reasons why you should attend these type of conferences. I was on the uh, conference in Turkey, in Atlanta for all the LDCs. And that was great because I could really speak not only with the governmental officials, but also with different ins institutions, organizations, to really get a deeper understanding what is needed right now, what are the priorities, because it's extremely sad that also we sit mm. at home and <coughs> think this is our, our government's priority, this is uh, Swedfund's priority, but there are so many things happening so rapidly so I think <coughs> that is very yeah. uh, one of the most beneficial thing we're taking part uh, of these type of conferences. And uh, I just want to say I agree on the SME. There is a gap. Uh, we're trying, as many of us, uh, to really address that gap <coughs> by uh, finding and looking for financial institutions, <coughs> banks, uh, funds, that has a stronger focus towards SME lending, but still uh, doing it directly, it's really difficult. Hey, Luke. Yeah, I want to pick up on the question about the relationship between incubators and venture capitalists. Um, we're involved in some of that. Um, I think the challenge there is to see whether these initiatives that you're financing are scalable right from the beginning. Um, you know, it's, it's very nice to have small, you know, successful uh, initiatives in a country like Burundi where we're doing it. But in the end, you would want this to benefit to millions and millions of people. And I think one of the good examples there is what's been going on in the off-grid electricity, renewable energy sort of sector, uh, where the challenge is not only to find the capital to develop these systems, but also to develop the business model. And there are very nice startups who have developed business models of a sort of leasing system where people pay with their mobile phones through the M-Pesa mobile money um, transfer system, small amounts, $1, $2, to be able to pay electricity when they need it um, and make sure that they get it through systems that sort of enable us to put in 10, 15 million dollars into that so that in the end somebody with just one dollar can have the light for a child to be able to study in the evening and go to school. Can, can I ask, can I ask one of you, you all to just comment on the question my, my Danish friend asked about what is your contribution to sort of this larger global conversation about growth? Could any of you comment on that? Well, can I sort of lead on from yeah. what Luke said and which might, okay. might answer that question. What you get from DFIs is understanding whether a business can become successful or not. Okay. Yeah. And it's such an, it's such an important mm -hmm. skill because if what you're backing doesn't become successful longer term and craters, negative impact results. <coughs> People get employed, they set expectations in their families and their communities, etc. When they lose their jobs, that is devastating. We're not just talking about creating white elephants, which also happens if you don't invest wisely and you just throw money, money into the market. But if we're talking at the human level, what we're all about 
is building successful businesses that then can employ lots and lots of people longer term, pay lots of taxes, etc. But that is a hard skill to understand whether that small business that you might be looking at, that incubator that's creating things from the ground up, whether any of those are capable <coughs> of becoming sustainable businesses. Look, we should probably end it here. You all have been a very patient audience. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.